All right. I am pleased to be joined by the guys over at Sideline Sports or Sideline Sports Podcast. How's it going, guys? What's up, JJ? Appreciate you having us on, man. What up? What up? <clears throat> Pleasure being here. Yeah, thanks for coming on and kind of on late notice, but I want to talk more about the NFL Saw Your Podcast. Listen to a few episodes, and again, all the links will be down in the description below for you guys for your podcast. Um, but if you guys, before we start talking more about your podcast and stuff like that in the network, or actually before we start talking about the NFL Week 5, uh, if you guys want to tell me more about your podcast, more about the network, if you want to start off with that, Abe. Yeah, I mean, so uh, we've been in business for about a year now and basically has primarily been a podcast and uh, standing on the sideline. You can it's literally wherever you listen to podcasts. So feel free. You know what I'm saying? Subscribe, rate and follow all that good stuff. Um, and then, yeah, me and Asama kind of just been doing our thing. That's our other pod, that's our other uh, co-host who couldn't be here because he's just off adulting right now. So uh, and then uh, somewhere along the way, me and Sebastian, I've known Sebastian since like forever. So and I followed him on Twitter and I've just he's a very opinionated sports fan. And we, we had on for an episode and it just it was like it was you know humble brag i have a great eye for talent i was like bro we need to just do this permanently like for for, from now on and just we've been doing this what i mean i don't even know you've been here a couple of months now but i mean just great it's literally a good time we don't take ourselves too seriously but i feel like we're we're like the perfect representation of like your diehard sports fans yeah. Yeah. Cause listen to your, a few, uh, your, I think your latest two episodes, you kind of went down through all the NFL season. I thought that was kind of cool or all of week four, then it was week three before that. So yeah, it was great. Again, all the links will be down in the description below, but we're going to start with the more important games where we're just kind of go through there, but let's first start off with the Thursday night game between the Seahawks and Rams. Of course, the big story was Russell Wilson goes out. Um, do you think if Russell Wilson does miss four to eight weeks, do you think the Seahawks have any chance of making the playoffs? Short answer, no. <laughs> I mean, it's not fair. Come on, you got to give Gino his chance, bro. You got you to give him a try. He actually looked good filling in for Russell Wilson for the short short period that we saw him playing. But obviously that bad interception at the end really wasn't his fault that much. But, you know, it's still, it's still Gino. Um, I, I, there's too much talent on that team. You still have DK Metcalf. We saw his connection with DK Metcalf was actually strong. So I expect that to be consistent at least. DK is not a hard target to find. Um, and it depends on coaching. Like I said, if that defense can step up, they might have a chance. But that division is very tough. Uh, it's it's going to be it's gonna be close to impossible. I'm going to just hope that Russ comes back quicker. Geno Smith is what Jameis Winston will end up as if he doesn't stop messing around. And we literally saw it like when he came in, we're like, oh, my God, Geno Smith. Why has this not worked out yet? And then you see the interception. You're like, oh, my God, that's why it hasn't worked out yet. Like, I get why you're the backup. But I just I don't think that he's he's as capable to lead. I mean, other than DK and Tyler Lockett, that running game is essentially non-existent. Now you put Geno Smith in there, who's not Russ. He can't make plays <laughs> for himself out there on offense. And. I just, I, like you said, that division is ridiculous. I don't see them making out of it alive. I think if they were maybe, I know the NFC North is pretty much a one team race right now with the Packers and maybe the Bears can get better. But I think if the Seahawks, they would have a better chance of competing in the NFC North and the NFC West or yeah, the NFC West. Um, and I think also at the same time, Geno Smith is better than we, he's better than I think a lot of people give him credit for. And he was with the Jets for a while. I think that's kind of what messed him up. Um, and of course, I think his last start came against the Giants back in 2017. I think he looked pretty solid when I last when he last started. But I just I don't think the Seahawks are going to make it either. I like to give Geno Smith a try. But with how good that division is, with how good the Rams are, with how good the uh, Cardinals are, the Niners, I think are going to be solid. It really depends on how good Trey Lance is and if Jimmy G will ever. I don't know. I think they need to stay stick with Trey Lance. But um, what did you think about Matt Stafford's performance? Because he didn't play his best, but he was still able to get the win um, versus the Seahawks. Yeah, I mean, it was he didn't have his best showing, but it was just the, the better team won that day. And I feel like especially losing a player like Russ, you don't really have to do that much to beat that Seahawks team. I think they have a really overrated defense. Uh, you can just do your job and, and basically run whatever efficient offense that you can and just that defense is stifling when it needs to be. And so I think that that really, like the, the Rams are, there's like three teams at the beginning of the year that I, we, we had this conversation on our podcast, like immediate reaction week one, like these are the teams that are going to the Super Bowl and some ridiculous type stuff. 
Um, and the Rams low key were one of them. And I think they still could be. We saw that Matt Stafford Cooper Cup connection. They just started getting Robert Woods involved in the offense. He loves Tyler Higby. He's like one of the best fantasy tight ends in the league. Uh, if they get that running game figured out, Rams are a very good team. Yeah, and I think uh, before the season started, I actually had him as my Super Bowl prediction because I really liked what what Matt Stafford and Sean McVay can do together. It's like it's completely opposite of what Jared Goff did, and I don't want to disrespect Jared Goff, but he is the Rams were not the same. We're not that great with Jared Goff. He was just relying on Sean McVay, and now that Sean McVay actually has a quarterback that can actually relate to him, it's almost unstoppable. And especially how good Cooper Cup is. Like, I really wish I had him on a fantasy right now. I think he's the best fantasy receiver out there. Like, he's going to, of course, they had, I think they have, the, in the offseason, they had breakfast together all the time, and they would basically do drills right in the morning. So, uh, you can definitely tell that connection is there. And I feel like Cooper Cup, I guess he is technically a top 10 receiver, maybe even a top five. That might be a little bit of a stretch. But the, with the way he's performing, it's been really excellent to watch. So, um, let's go on to the game in London. I mean, this is kind of two teams that probably won't make the playoffs. Um, <laughs> it's usually, I don't want to say anything bad about both teams, but it's basically the, the trash bowl between these two teams. Um, but what did you actually think about, what did you think about the Falcons performance versus the jets on Sunday? Uh, well, very underwhelming game. I'm pretty sure none of us actually caught most of that game unless you decided to wake up early to watch <clears throat> garbage. Uh, but I was actually surprised, um, considering that the Falcons were going in there dealing with injuries and the fact that um, Calvin Ridley was not traveling with the team for his own personal issues, whatever the case may be. Um, we actually got to see Kyle Pitts have a breakout game. And I think that's that's great. I'm pissed off about it because I, I actually benched him in my fantasy uh, this week because I'm like, you know, early morning game, no one else. He's going to the Jets surprisingly played good defense. And then, you know, I, I went back and looked at their schedule and it was like it's expected against like the competition that they were playing against also. So those numbers are inflated highly. Um, that team sucks. They both suck. I'll say it for you. They both they both suck. They like they're, they're, there's no there's no better way to say this. Um, and it was a shit fest. And literally just to watch Atlanta manage to literally pull that out. It's just, it's just sad to say that I thought personally that they weren't going to win. So the jets are one of the most confusing teams in the NFL. It's like, you guys win an overtime game against the Titans, but then it's like, you get embarrassed by the Falcons in London. It's like, they don't even watch American football like that. They're just happy. You're there. They're happy to be there. They don't care who wins. And it's like Zach Wilson you want to talk about inconsistent. This kid can be really good at times. Then at other times, you're like, there's no way that you were drafted as high as you were. It doesn't, you can't make this up. Yeah. Zach Wilson was Zach Wilson again. I mean, he was great against the Titans, but he went back to his old Zach Wilson and he's only a rookie. So I think the jets should give him a little more time than they did Sam Darnold. But I mean, it's just the jets. Like, I don't know how good Sam, Zach Wilson can actually be if he's on another team, but I just think the jets need to be a little more patient with them. And I think this is a throwaway year for the Jets, just like it's a throwaway year for the Jags and just like it's a throwaway year for the Lions. Like, I mean, both these teams aren't making the playoffs and definitely the Jets. Um, let's go to another game as well. The Broncos Steelers. I was a little surprised the Broncos able to pull that out. Big Ben played well, even though I think it's his last year and he's been he hasn't been great this year at all. Uh, what did you guys think about Big Ben's performance versus the Broncos? Well, uh, you said Broncos pulled it off. The Steelers actually won that game. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. bad. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, I know what you meant, though. Uh, Big Ben, surprisingly, like, we actually talked about this last time. I said that they would win this game because <clears throat> I thought that Tomlin would make it happen for him to have, you know, just a few more seconds to throw the ball. And literally, like, that's, that's all it took because they actually looked – decent they look better I know Juju got hurt but you saw Big Ben throwing that 50 yard touchdown just to begin the game um to Deontay Johnson like I said before Big Ben can throw the ball still he just doesn't have any mobility like that's, that's he's a statue and that's the only big issue with them if that defense can step up they should be able to compete and like I said unfortunately Juju got hurt but their receiving core is deep enough to still be able to put up numbers and Najee Harris who just doesn't get off the field is it was, it was a perfect opportunity for big uh for Pittsburgh to bounce back this week. 
Yeah, I think the Broncos are just – they're frauds. Like, you have to say – you look at, like, who they beat, the Giants, the Jets, the Jaguars, I believe, and then it's like your real test this year against the Ravens you lost, and now you lose this game as well to the Steelers, who really aren't a good team this year at all whatsoever. Uh, I just think that that defense is, like, their shining spot on that team, but realistically, like, this team is just – like, them, the Raiders, there's just a lot of teams out here who their their records are not indicative of how good they truly are. The one thing I got kind of from the Broncos and Steelers game, I don't know why I said the Broncos won that game. That was totally on. That was my bad. But what I and like the Broncos offense was super conservative. I didn't like what they did. I think it was like early in the game and they got a they uh, Big Ben fumbled. They got the ball at the 28 yard line on a fourth and two at the 21. They decided to kick a field goal like I would have gone for it there. You don't get it, then that's fine. At least you actually tried. But I thought the Broncos offense was way too conservative in that game and they came back. Scott somewhat I mean they almost had a comeback there I think it was fourth and goal to two but Bridgewater threw an interception but I just thought the Steelers Steelers looked better but I feel like the Broncos offense was just way too conservative in that game but I mean we'll see what they do because I think the Broncos and Raiders play next week which we'll see that that's going to be an interesting game I feel like but um I try to think of some other games. Of course, I do kind of want to talk more about the Chiefs and Bills but did you guys have another game that you guys wanted to point out on Sunday? Yeah, absolutely. The Bengals Packers game, 1000%. I, I'm a big Joey B guy. Anybody that if you have ever heard any of our podcasts, you know, I love this guy. He just drips swag pause, but I I'm like way too invested in the Bengals and I'm not even a Bengals fan. Like that game gave me heart palpitations. And I, I, by the time like Mason Crosby missed the fourth one and then McPherson missed out, I was like, I'm done. I'm not even watching this anymore. Like this doesn't, my game doesn't start till 425 and I'm already going to have a heart attack. It doesn't make any sense, but that game, you want to talk about nobody wanted to win. We do a pick them show. And I had to text the group chat. I was like, listen, group vote right now. If this game ends in a tie, no win, no loss for anybody. Cause this is a shit show. Did you think it – well, what did you think about the Packers and Bengals game, Sebastian? I mean, I personally, I thought it was closer than it needed to be. Um, the Bengals actually are showing that they're they're legit in a sense. You know, um, I was sleeping on them early in the, uh, this season. Abud was always against me doing that, you know, talking big up about Joey B. But, you know, you have to say, like, they're playing against the Packers. The Packers are one of the top teams in the NFL – um, one of the top teams in the NFC for sure. And you're looking at Joey B and like the whole the whole pod was thinking Packers all day. And I just didn't think it'd, be, it'd even be that competitive. Joey B looks good, man. Um, I actually thought he was going to get hurt. I actually thought he got hurt during that game. Good thing he uh, he came back and played. Um, uh, if you guys didn't catch that, I know he went to the hospital after. Supposedly he got poked in the throat or whatever, and he was having issues talking after, so I hope he gets better um, and hope that doesn't affect him later on. Uh, um, but, yeah, it, strong showing for them. They should have won because the Packers just gave you a gimme. That doesn't happen. You don't you don't get that chance. And then for your kicker to come up, and it's just like you always have that conversation. You got one job, just do it right. And <laughs> no one wanted to win that game. It was just – it was crazy. I never experienced something like that in, like, most recent years. Yeah, and you got to be even on both sides because if we're going to sit here, we're going to praise him. That interception was horrendous. I'm talking about that was some big Ben throwing it right at the linebacker, not even yeah. seeing it right in your face. And I knew like he was pissed on the sideline after that one. But that that Jamar Chase connection, that's that's some that's the greatest troll job in all of sports. Well, the thing about uh, Joe Burrow, he's so tough. Like he took so much hits, and of course, last year what he did with the uh, Bengals before he got injured, but. Joe Burrow is one of the toughest quarterbacks out there, which is very impressive. And I think the Bengals are still a year away from really competing. And plus with the NFC or with not with the AFC North being, I think either the Ravens or Browns division, I just think the Bengals still are a year away, but yeah, Jamar, uh, Jamar chase, I think right now is probably the leading candidate for offensive rookie of the year, but uh, yeah, he's so tough. And of course, what I'm surprised too, is this is the second time Mason Crosby has missed more than three field goals in one game. Like, if it was any other kicker or any other, if Mason Crosby was in India with any other team, he would probably not have a job today. Like I think he missed four against the Lions back in 2018 and he still had a job the next day and they lost by eight. If he would have made three of his four field goals, they would have, they would end up winning the game. But like, I think if Mason Crosby was another team, he would cut him. But if, if I was a team, I would cut Mason Crosby right away. I just don't think he's a good kicker. I know he had that uh, kicking streak, but I mean, you can't miss three field goals in one game. I mean, that's not what good kickers. Justin Tucker would 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 not do that. I'll, I'll be honest with you there. So, um, it just 
I don't know, Mason Crosby, not a great kicker. Surprisingly, he still has a job. So let's go into another game. The Buccaneers Dolphins Buccaneers pretty much dominated. What did you guys, were you guys surprised by the, how bad the Dolphins performed? Uh, no, honestly, the Dolphins, we live in South Florida. So I live in this delusional world where the Miami Dolphins think that they're Super Bowl contenders every year. And then they get that like humbling moment where they come back down to earth. And you want to talk about just the definition of flexing. Like this was just a flex for the Buccaneers. This wasn't even, I think this was Tom Brady's first 400 yard, five touchdown game of his career, which is ridiculous because he's played for 46 years. So the fact that he's just achieving this now is, is a, a little bit wild, but I mean, they're, they are the defending Super Bowl champions for a reason. Um, I don't think they're the best team in the NFC. You know, maybe a little foreshadowing if we get to that a little bit later on. But, uh, they're, you know, they're a powerhouse for a reason. Yeah. What do you think about that, Sebastian? Or... I mean, same thing. I mean, I didn't think Brady would still be on that field that late, to be honest. Um, it's like he was just stat padding out there. A.B., man, um, literally Bucks number one receiver now. It doesn't make sense to me how he's – I don't know if you guys know that. Since he's been on the Bucks, he's the most targeted wide receiver on that team. And he, considering that he's he's actually missed games also and everything, and with all the issues A.B. has with him with himself, it's kind of, like, highly interesting. He looks great. Um freaking Tom Brady and him are just they have a sick connection and even their running game was going for it. net look good Giovanni Bernard was scoring like it's just it's it was just a showing that had to be done like the, and the Dolphins suck like Abu just told you I've been experiencing this in my whole life bro that's actually why I hate the Dolphins personally is because their fans are just delusional man they think Tua is the next coming um a great quarterback and it's just uh, that that team is just it's pathetic it's just terrible if they do end up having another losing season, is Brian Flores gone or do they keep him for one more year? No, nah, you got to keep Flo. It's not his fault that that team is just underperforming. It's a bunch of guys that aren't living up to contracts and it's, it's not his fault. Tua, we don't even know if he's the guy because his availability, his availability is always questionable. But I think if you guys really tank it this year, just go all in for whoever the best quarterback is because I still think Brian Flores is a great defensive-minded head coach. And if he gets, like, a competent quarterback who can efficiently run an offense, the Dolphins could contend in, in a pretty relatively weaker AFC East than we're used to seeing. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, would should the Dolphins try to trade for Deshaun Watson if he's available or whenever that, like, whenever Deshaun Watson is available, should the Dolphins make that move for him? A simple answer is yes. That's the obvious answer. Um, again, with what you have in your own quarterback room right now, they have Tua and Jacoby Brissett. We all know Deshaun Watson is like, if, if he was playing right now, like top five quarterback in the NFL. Um, unfortunately, he has all those allegations with him. I think once that's cleared, he'll be gone. I don't think he'll ever play again for Houston. I think that door is closed um, regardless of how it goes down. But the Dolphins have been that one team that's been highly named um, for Deshaun Watson, them and the Eagles, surprisingly. And I hope with what Jalen Hurts is doing now, their name is out. But Deshaun Watson is always going to be a hot commodity, especially with the fact that Tua got hurt already. Come on, man. They're going to they're gonna do their best to land that guy as long as he's clear. Yeah, and I've heard a lot, like I said, Tua to the um, Dolphins, Tua to the Eagles, Tua to the Panthers, or not Tua, uh, Deshaun Watson to the Panthers. I think, I mean, I think the Dolphins would make the most sense. I just don't know. Would you guys think the Dolphins would be a playoff team with Deshaun Watson? Yeah. He, he won a division title with the Houston Texans. Like, I'm pretty sure if he goes anywhere else, he, they're a pretty competitive team. Yeah, I think I think Deshaun Watson's a top five quarterback. Um, do you have anything else to add to that, Sebastian? I was gonna say, didn't he have didn't he have D Hop out there with him when he won that? Like, yeah, he wouldn't have that in Miami. So that's the only problem that that receiving core. Um, besides Jalen Waddle, I feel like everyone else is just underwhelming to me. You, you're not a Devontae Parker fan, bro. You don't think that that guy's the uh, the truth? No, no, nah, no, nah, bro. Yeah, no, nah, me neither. Nah, nah, bro. <laughs> Devontae Parker's had some moments and I think he's been re-signed like twice by the Dolphins. I don't know. He just, he seems to not be, I don't know. It just seemed like Devontae Parker, I think it was in 2019. He had a solid year, but I don't know. He just has been kind of quiet since then. But I mean, I like Devontae Parker because I'm a Louisville fan. He's from Louisville. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping he gets better, but we'll see there. Um, I don't know if you want to exactly talk about this game, but the Cowboys and Giants, I mean, the Cowboys, 
They look good. Um, the Giants, of course, with all their injuries. I honestly had the Giants winning the division before the season started, but I think that is is past. But um, do you guys want to talk about that game? Yeah, JJ, I had them winning the division too, pal. And guess what? Sitting here at one and four, I feel pretty stupid. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, we could talk about that game. I mean, it's just ridiculous the amount of injuries that can strike within a span of like five minutes. You talk about Saquon, low ankle sprain. He's going to be out. DJ's concussion, he got up. He was like mush mouth, foaming out the mouth, tripping over himself. Kenny Galladay has a knee injury. We're already without Slay and Shep. Then Blake Martinez is out for the year. Adoree Jackson is just abysmal. I don't know what he's doing out there. He is the biggest finesse of all time. Like the fact that we paid him that much money to just literally sit there and watch players burn him is just, it's, oh man, it's just this, this team. It's, uh, ah. I think, I think that was like the most, the most watched highlight this weekend was Saquon twisting his ankle. Like, I think that's messed up too. Like they just kept playing it and kept showing that swollen ankle out there. Like, it's just like, yo, dude, take this off my screen. Like I've seen this already 25 times today. Like they just kept showing it again and again. It's, it's not even that he did. It's how it happened. Where it's, it's how like, it happened. It was just you get so overthrown on a route and you're just kind of like walking and then you just step on the corner's foot. And now all of a sudden you're out four to eight weeks. Or they're like, but there's a chance he could play next week. Like fam. Sit down. Don't come back for what? We're one in four. Like, what are we playing for at this point? I think that you can't um, forget also the fact that, you know, uh, Kadarius Tony had a breakout game. Broke Odell records, uh, Odell punch. Beckham's rookie record for receptions and receiving yards and all that. Yeah, and then chose to punch a cowboy in the, in the helmet to get ejected out of the game, um, which, again, wouldn't, wouldn't have changed the uh, – I, take, I I approve of that. I'm not gonna lie to you, because at that point, that's like a that's a me would, move. That's a me move. Hey, I'm not gonna lie to you. I would too. I mean, the kid's young, but like I said, I was trying to say like you guys have like a, a a good player there. It's it's sad to say that you guys haven't been using him that much to begin the season. But now that he's out there, I hope that when Shepard comes back and Slayton comes back, that you guys still have Tony out there lined up because he's electric. That kid was just making moves. Nice. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, the Giants just – I think they're kind of an underwhelming team, but I, the Cowboys are a lot better than I expected. And every year when I look at the NFC East, the Cowboys always have the most talented roster, but it's the Cowboys. Like, I don't want to pick the Cowboys. It's like picking the Raiders. They're always going to underachieve somehow. But maybe this is a different Cowboys team. Dak Prescott is healthy for the first time in a while, it seems like. Um, I mean, maybe this Cowboys team can win. I don't think they're the best team in the NFC. Uh, but speaking of the best team in the NFC, the Cardinals beat the 49ers 17-10. Do you think the Cardinals are the best team in the NFC or even the best team in the NFL right now? Yes. This was my team that week one, I said, uh, this, this was my ridiculous hot take that I was like, if we're going off of just first week impressions, the Cardinals are going to the Super Bowl. Like, I have no doubt about it because the way that they – week one, when they were locked in and they were able to just do whatever they wanted out there, DeAndre Hopkins, Rondell Moore, it, it, Kyler Murray just making plays on, with his feet. It's like now they have an elite defense as well. Chandler Jones with that monster first game. Now you pair J.J. Watt. They were in, like, the Stephon Gilmore bidding, but obviously that didn't work out. But that team is – that's, not only are they a good team, that's a fun team to watch. And Cliff Kingsbury is an incredible offensive play caller. Um, and I, I think that now that he's had the time to put the team together that he wants, Cardinals are going to be a force in the NFC for a little minute now. And I, I was a big Kyler Murray doubter. Seabass knows that. And he was always getting on my ass about it. But this year, it's like every week he's looking in the camera at me like, you are wrong. This is why I'm winning MVP. Did you, uh, did you have anything to add to that, Sebastian? No, I mean, it's everything is said right there. I mean, the team looks great. And I, th and I think until they lose, um, nothing else can be said about them. Because even tough games, they're grinding them out and they're winning. Um, against San Fran, it was, a, it was a tough game. I actually didn't expect it to be that close. Um, I don't know if that's props to Trey Lance or props to the 49ers defense overall. They actually bottled up D-Hop for most of that game. Um, and which again, it just shows, it just comes to show you that the, the Cardinals are just so deep, man, that you can just lock away D hop. You got Rondell Moore. I don't know if you got, I don't know if you guys saw that sick catch he made on the sideline. Um, it's just, and he's a rookie, you know, and then you still have AJ Green lined up right there. And it's just, it's just mind blowing. They're tight end. Max Williams is actually pretty good. And their running backs, freaking Chase Edmonds. It's just, it's just, it's just too much. And when you have Kyler Murray lined up, operating this whole thing like you see his he can literally go from zero to like 
20 miles per hour and literally stop on a dime. It's just, he's incredible. I don't see anyone that can really beat that team unless they beat themselves. Yeah, I think Kyler Murray should definitely, I mean, he probably is somewhere in that top three MVP discussion, maybe just overall the MVP. Um, but I just, it's what's crazy about this Cardinals team is Cliff Kingsbury was not very good in college. Like he had Patrick Mahomes, and I think he had Evan Ingram as well. And yet they didn't, they made it to what, one bowl game? And they were five and seven his last year. He gets fired, gets hired by USC as an offensive coordinator. They get hired by the Cardinals. Like, it's just crazy. It just, it goes to show you that I guess you don't necessarily have to be a great college coach to be a good NFL coach. You just have to have the right, I don't, I don't really know exactly what the deal is, but I think Kyler Murray, I don't know if he bails out Cliff Kingsbury, but I mean, Kingsbury's done a, a, a decent job, but I feel like it's more of Kyler Murray. But I mean, do you guys think that, do, do you, who do you, or, who do you think was more or should have or should be praised more for the Cardinals, Kyler Murray or Cliff Kingsbury? I think it's Kyler for sure. Um, and we spoke we spoke about that recently, actually, on our podcast. And we were talking about, like, you know, coaches not really deserving their jobs. And Kingsbury's name came up because, you know, like, even though he's doing a good job, you know, like, it's like we, we can't really say anything bad about him. But did he really deserve that position? You know what I mean? And that's that's kind of like, even if you look at last year, there's so many big plays, like the best plays that the Arizona Cardinals have is literally like a broken down play that Kyler is making something happen with. Um, Kyler, throw, like, you know, scrambling out the pocket all the way up to the uh, line of scrimmage and throwing it a ball a bomb deep to D-Hop, who's mossing four players in the end zone. Like, that's not that's not Cliff. That's not him. You know, like, I, I don't want to take anything away from him either. But it's just when you have that much talent. You know, like, it's just, I don't know how you can mess that up. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously, like, super players first. So, of course, like, the, Kyler taking this big step forward, he should be, you know, rewarded with all of the, the praise and all the credit and stuff. But also, like, shoot Cliff Kingsbury some – some. I have my phone. Shoot him some, some bail because uh, – his level of offense, there's like a learning curve when you go from college football to the pros. And there's some stuff that you just can't do in college because these kids are incapable of like learning offense to that. Unless you have like some incredible once in a lifetime generational talent, your average college football player is not Peyton Manning. He's not Ray Lewis. He's not Patrick Willis. They don't have the capacity to hold all this knowledge in. So you're very limited in terms of what you can run. Once you get to the NFL, you have so much more opportunity to run these things because the talent is so it, it's more than you've ever seen in your entire life. And also to give him some credit, he's the one that wanted to draft Kyler Murray. There was a lot of speculation on what they could do with that number one overall pick. And, you know, he was hell bent on, no, this is going to be the guy. This is the guy I want to like lead this team. And I think that to some degree, you have to credit him a little bit with Kyler's development. Yeah. I think again, Kyler Murray is great. Be when, I think when Cliff Kingsbury got hired by the Cardinals, I wasn't a Kyler Murray doubter. I was more of a doubter of Cliff Kingsbury. If you couldn't succeed in college, how do you expect to succeed in the NFL? But it's been a completely opposite. And of course, Kyler Murray is just, he's, he's a great quarterback. And I think he's very underrated at times. Um, I do want to get to this game before we start talking about the chiefs and uh, bills. And of course, I wish I could talk about the Ravens and Colts, but they're actually being, they're playing right now at the time of this recording. But uh, the Browns and Chargers, that was a great game. The Chargers might be the best team in the AFC, uh, but they get the win over the Browns, 47-42. I mean, is Justin Herbert an MVP? It, do you have? I think you have to put Justin Herbert in the MVP candidate, right? Yeah, 1,000%. This was also like another ridiculous take that I had, I, you know, if we're going off of just week one performances, and especially after they beat the Chiefs. I said the Chargers are going to win the AFC West. They're going to win that division. And he's been making me look right every week. Like this, we constantly have conversations about quarterbacks when they go up against other top tier quarterbacks. How do you respond, especially if you go up against a Patrick Mahomes who can go the length of the field in 18 seconds and your offense has to go right back out there and respond? How do you respond? And Justin Herbert has has answered that call all year. This Cleveland Browns game, this was like a big 12 college football game. There was no defense. 1,200 total yards. There was like 100. What was the final score? 55, 40, something like that. Something? I, I don't know. 47, 42, I think. JJ, that's why you're the host, because you remember yeah. stuff like that. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this was an incredible game. Uh, you know, neither team really disappointed. The Browns are a very good football team. Um, and they've come a long way from what we're used to seeing out of the Cleveland Browns. But yeah, I mean, at this point, I, I want to say this right here on your podcast first. Uh, at my Super Bowl prediction, Cardinals Chargers, and I think it's going to be electric. No, no pun intended. 
That would definitely be exciting. I would definitely be for that. I think I predict the Ravens and Rams, which that could happen. I mean, imagine if the Rams and Chargers played in the Super Bowl in that LA stadium. Of course, I don't know if there would be that many Rams and Chargers fans because, of course, the Chargers really have none. But nobody I mean, has home field advantage. It's just like a bunch of dudes like Rob Lowe wearing the NFL hat. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let's go to the main game. Of course, the uh, Bills and Chiefs. The Bills just, I don't know what's up with the Chiefs. Their defense is terrible. Um, but I don't know. Is it time to start panicking if you're the Chiefs right now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And I hate to say it because, you know, it just sounds like I'm just trying to, like, you know, say it just to talk talk trash and everything. Listen, we have to be realistic. It's Patrick Mahomes. They still have Tyreek Hill out there, Travis Kelsey. They're great on offense. But as long as they're playing against a team that's going to be able to compete and put up points also and, like, you know, maintain the scoring just like they do, they're going to be in trouble. And obviously, I'm not saying, like, they should panic. Like, they're going to make the playoffs. We all know they're going to be in the playoffs. It's just that right now, we already saw that if they actually play the Bills again, I, I, don't, I don't think this team can beat Buffalo because that defense is just is just great. Josh Allen is amazing. He's over here hurdling the players out there in the field. Like, think about think about your investment just jumping over alignment. That's just that's that's crazy. And it's just it's just when you see Patrick Mahomes, I know Clyde got hurt. I know you hurt his knees out for a few weeks. So there goes an injury right here. They signed Josh Gordon. We'll see how that goes. Again, offense is great, but the defense is Swiss cheese. They suck. It doesn't make sense. Even the Eagles were freaking putting up. Jalen Hurts has his career high against against the Chiefs, and they, that, that's and they had other bad L's earlier in the season. And I see more coming because again, defense can't stop anything. Yeah, did you have anything to add to that, Abe? So the Chiefs are literally their own worst enemy because they they try to go for the money shot every single time when Mm -hmm. literally six yard chunk plays are available to them at will at will. And you see it when they're down multiple scores that they can pick up eight yards when they need to. They can pick up seven yards when they need to six yards, but they're they're not they don't want to be complacent, I guess. I, I don't know what really you could categorize that as, but I feel like if Patrick Mahomes develops some patience and actually is able to sit there and kind of, you know, obviously everybody knows he has a cannon. I'm not expecting them to come out and run a West coast offense, but it's like, look for those underneath routes, look for those little five and ins, look for those little breakout routes. So that something in the flats. Cause like I said, with that offense and with so many deep threats and how many receivers and Travis Kelsey that demand double coverage, something underneath is always open, but Patty just, he refuses it. This man said, you know, like, F it. I could sling this thing 80 yards if I want to. He's Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite. I could throw it over the mountains right there. And he could do it, too. All right. Yeah, that's 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 a pretty funny comparison. All right. So I want to talk about some more things, but we're starting to run out of time. If you guys want to add anything more about your podcast, about the network, um, pretty much before we end the interview. All right. So SLS Inc., you guys already know what it is. If you don't know now, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Authentic sports fans that are bringing you conversations that you have in your living room with your friends and group chats at bars, wherever you go. Um, You know, just trying to introduce something a little bit different to the sports podcasting space, the sports media space. Honestly, be sure to follow us on all of our socials at SLS Inc. I'm not going to use our usual sign off because I don't want to disrespect you on your podcast, but there's something that I usually say. I'm not going to say it here, but I appreciate JJ. I mean, honestly, just reaching out for the collaboration. We need to schedule something and get you on for sure. One hundred percent. Flip it on you. Ask you some questions. You know what I'm saying? For sure. For sure. It was definitely a pleasure being on here. It was great. Great conversation. We love talking about sports all the time. That's just what we do. And like I said, we just have fun doing it. So it's again, pleasure being here. All right. Again, thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm definitely down whenever you, I mean, I'm, I'm down. So again, all the links will be down in the description below. Um, And again, thanks for coming on, guys, and have a wonderful night. Take it easy, man. Peace.